All right, let's start. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to this new YMP Switzerland event. Uh, so we can see already a lot of people connected today. So that's that's very good because today we have um, we're holding our very first panel discussion with a great speaker and field experts. Um, before starting, I'd like to remind the audience to stay on mute. Uh, at the end of the discussion, we will allow 10 minutes for questions from the audience. Feel free to add your question in the chat and we will ask it to our panelists. Please note that the meeting is being recorded. I want... oh, okay, please, <laughs> please stay on mute, thank you. Uh, so our topic today is mining electrification. Uh, fuel consumption at mines can represent up to 80% of a mine carbon emissions. As all industries are working toward reducing their emissions, the mining industry is focusing more and more on reducing fuel consumption through electrification. This transformation requires a new set of technology, skills, and as well, new type of collaboration. To discuss our to discuss how to conduct this transformation, we are joined today by speakers from different parts of the mining industry, all contributing to the electrification journey. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Merzad Ashnagaran, Global Product Line Manager, Electrification and E-Mine Initiative Lead at ABB. Jonas Rangard, Manager, Mines Energy Program at Boliden. Mark Davis, Group Technical Executive at Glencore and Johannes Valivara, Product Line Manager, Mining and Tunneling at Sandvik. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us today. To start with, and for the benefit of our audience, I'd like if each of you to tell us in a few minutes, how is your company involved and how is it positioned on this mining electrification journey? And I will start with you, Merzad, as representative of the companies providing the infrastructure to mines. Thank you. Uh, uh, I start with uh, my introduction. My name is Mersad Oshnegar. I'm uh, uh, 26 years in mining business, uh, 22 years with ABB in a different position in uh, business development and sales of large project. And uh, in the last four years, uh, uh, I'm responsible globally for product line electrification and composite plan with a big focus on all electric mine which e-mine is uh, uh, a kind of response to this market. I am leading that initiative. Uh, we are committed to our uh, industry, uh, which is mining industry, to do this uh, energy transition. And in this uh, way, we are committed to help our customer together with also our uh, partners that uh, our miners and our customer meet the sustainability target. Uh, also stay competitive and also in the same time increase productivity. Uh, we are not newcomer in this market. We are almost 130 years in electrification of the mine and uh, uh, we uh, continue this journey also with this e-mine concept. We started 130 years ago with the electrification of hoist system in Sweden. Uh, but what is the e-mine? Uh, e-mine make this all electric mine happen. Is a integration of a different type of the solution, electrification solution, digital solution and automation solution in order to reduce zero, uh, uh, to, to reduce the actual greenhouse gas emission in the mine. Uh, is also a kind of continuation of our uh, past efforts in electrification of the entire mine, what we call it plant business, uh, fully integrated seamless portfolio, which was vertically, horizontally integrated uh, uh, from pit to the port in the mine, including uh, several different solutions like uh, grinding system, hoist system, uh, uh, bell combine system, high power rectifier, uh, water system, and uh, ventilation on demand, and many other solutions. For uh, e-mine is a, more or less is a kind of last piece of puzzle to make this picture complete, extending our uh, electrification capability towards mine area uh, to be able to uh, uh, energize and power the uh, uh, mining trucks and mining fleets because everything there was based on the fossil fuel energy. That, uh, that's why that's why that we were absent there. But now with the integration of the e-mine portfolio, e-mine solution, we want to power the um, actual mining trucks and mining fleets with the e-mine solution, e-mine portfolio, including trolley system, including fast charging system, and some other solution that we have uh, already incorporated in our e-mine portfolio. 
Uh, I can say also in this way, by integration in mind, we try to uh, also to optimize the uh, energy usage and energy efficiency. Uh, by that way, also we, we can reduce the OPEX for the customer, also improve the productivity. Needless to say that this has also improved the sustainability and also in the same time, uh, reduction of the uh, the pollution, reduction of the, the hazards, and also in the same time improve the health and safety. That was uh, in a nutshell what is behind EMI. Thank you very much, Merzad. And I'd like now to move to the OEM manufacturer. So, Johannes, can you can you tell us how is Sunvik involved in in the electrification? Yep. Thanks, and happy to meet everybody. So, yeah, briefly also to introduce my background as well. I've been working in the company for roughly. Uh, 16 years mainly uh, regarding different sort of uh, mining technologies. So um, here at Sandvik, uh, the electrification has been pretty much our focus areas quite some time already. I mean, we do have in the Sandvik mining and rock solution business area, we have six different uh, divisions responsible to manufacture all sorts of um, mining equipment. We are talking about loaders, uh, trucks, we are talking about drills for both underground and surface mining uh, parts and services around those, as well as different sort of uh, digital solutions. So uh, the underground drills uh, business division in, in which I'm actually located, uh, we introduced the first uh, battery driven uh, mining jumbo to the industry around 2016. The very traditional use case to, to use a drill underground would be to have a diesel combustion engine to drive the unit from one place to another, take the power from the electric to do the drilling. Uh, the technology, what we've uh, developed nicely, basically combines these two together. So hence there are no need anymore for, for the diesel combustion engine itself. So we actually, when we are connected um, to the grid, we charge the batteries so that when we have drilled a specific fan or a specific round, the batteries are pretty much fully loaded and the unit can drive uh, to the next location. And of course, this is part of the larger narrative what we have been working with in, in uh, helping our customers, of course, to go towards this um, zero emission underground mine. So that's a very brief overview of our offering here at, at Sandwich. Thank you, Jonas. And uh, I'd like now to hear from, from the miners and we will start with uh, Jonas from Boliden. Jonas. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Jonas Rangord. Uh, I am an energy engineer. Um, started at Boli and pretty much straight after my studies finished. Work, been working here for seven years, uh, most part as a program manager, managing uh, our energy program, which basically means that I'm responsible for uh, providing technical solutions that will enable Boli then to reach uh, our CO2 targets. And looking at Bull Eden's emissions, we uh, already, already today know that we are uh, leading within, within uh, this, this, uh, this industry. And uh, we have launched, uh, for example, low carbon zinc and low carbon copper products that we actually do get premiums on. I mean, it's not much, but it is something. And we see that this, this market will expand. Um, Looking at uh, where our CO2 emissions are coming from, um, the vast majority is diesel, especially since we are located in Nordic countries with general low CO2 footprint on the electrical power grid. So that's why we've been focusing very much on mine electrification because we can get really good results from day one by electrifying diesel equipment. Uh, and there we, just to mention a couple of projects we have, uh, of course, commissioned the, in 2018, we commissioned the, the trolley line in ITIC, um, which generated some buzz within the industry. Um, and after that, we concluded to expand the trolley investments with 30 million euros, uh, building more trolley lines in ITIC and also expand in, build the first one and expand trolley lines in Kevitsa. But of course, our long-term target is to not only build trolley lines, but also switch out the diesel engines for battery packs. Uh, and there we're collaborating with a bunch of suppliers, but, but uh, perhaps the most important right now is our collaboration in Komatsu's Greenhouse Gas Alliance, uh, hopefully being an early adopter of the first battery trucks. 
uh, when it comes to underground electrification, we have this Rav Liden uh, initiative that is our take on the first, our first uh, fossil free underground mine where we will uh, into 2023 build the first underground trolley line together with ABB and Epiroc. Um, and very, hopefully verify that technology so that we can scale it up and use it in full production in 2025 and therefore have having a completely diesel free load and haul in a relatively small underground mine um, and also this week next week we will commission the our um, 74 ton battery truck from Scania uh, transporting ore from Renström to Bolid and Area concentrator so a lot of uh, interesting uh, projects either recently started or around the corner. Thank you, Jonas. And, and to conclude this first round, uh, Mark, how is Vencore involved in, in electrification? Thanks, Sean. And uh, look, thanks everyone for having the opportunity to join this, this discussion today with, with the, the young mining professionals. I think it's a fabulous opportunity to talk about this you know, most important activity in terms of our energy transition and especially um, the partnering and collaboration approach through this, this arrangement in terms of how all the, the, the energy and infrastructure type companies need to work with um, equipment manufacturers and the mining companies themselves. From a, a, a Glencore perspective, I guess I would, I would couch it by saying in terms of the energy transition, we find ourselves, you know, right in the middle of it. You know, we're part of the the problem in terms of being one of the world's top 100 emitters of carbon, if you look at our full full value chain emissions, but we're also part of the solution in terms of providing the metals that are required to drive it and enable the energy transition. So it's you know really central to our business strategy now, and uh, you know fundamentally, it sees us act in all of those areas. So you know as a corporation, um, because of that that. Um, that position, we've taken some pretty lofty um, goals and commitments in terms of reducing our our total footprint, being our scope one, two, and three emissions footprint by 15% by 2030, 2026 as a short-term goal, and then cutting it in half, 50% reduction by 2035 and, and a net zero ambition for 2050. And I mention that because you know the the orders of magnitude of of what the different businesses uh, are involved in, in terms of their operational footprint, as well as their value chain or indirect emissions. Um, you know, it gives a, a good overview in terms of where we need to be acting. Um, in terms of um, the, the acting on our footprint, um, you mentioned, John, at the start that, you know, a typical mine will have 80% of the emissions or thereabouts linked to, to diesel burn. And, and, you know, that's central to electrification. Um, just for the audience here, I'll, I'll kind of reinforce as well that, you know, as a mining company or a resource company, those that are more heavily integrated all the way from mine through to smelters tend to have a lot of emissions related to um, power purchase and to uh, use of reductants as well. So it sort of drives a, a a differing approach potentially across the different mining houses as to where we need to act in terms of uh, the energy transition. Um, certainly for, for Glencore, um, we've got a lot of um, actions around power purchase because it makes up about 40% of our um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and diesel, by the way, makes up about 15% but it's no, no less important um, to act on it because it's still you know, roughly about 5 million tonnes a year of, of CO2 equivalent emissions. Um, across our business, we've got you know, alignment from the, the company level strategy through to our, our assets in terms of developing a, a raft of options for abatement of carbon. And uh, certainly um, in the electrification area, we see that uh, um, the partnering type approach, which would be good to discuss in a bit more detail, is going to be really central to success. Um, certainly, when we come to electrification of mines, um, you know, our company strategy and the way we're working with the different parts of our business is that we don't see a single solution 
um, you know, driving all of the all of the outcomes, but certainly working on a on a on a mul multitude of solutions, and that that includes, you know, electrification of haul trucks, um, like Johannes said, in terms of trolley assist, and 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 uh, and and Jonas spoke about uh, on trolley assist, and, and also in terms of um, battery as well as hydrogen fuel cells on on trucks and mobile equipment. So we're working with partners across a range of areas to enable that to happen. But I think, um, you know, I just wanted to reinforce that um, for the audience, particularly um, demonstrating how we plan to remove carbon from our business as well as enable the transition um, as each of our companies are doing through the provision of solutions for the energy transition is, is equally important. Thank you, Mark, and th thanks uh, all for this uh, introduction. I think it gives good overview of uh, of your company role in in the electrification transformation and and helps to put some some context for for our audience. Uh, to start with, I'd like to touch a little bit on technology, and and we mentioned already different things like uh, a trolley assist, uh, hydrogen, and so on. But but two more details, like when we when we're talking about electrifying mines, which technology are we talking about? Is it like purely electric batteries, hydrogen, are there any other uh, solution we, which are maybe less obvious, which, uh, which are also being uh, implemented. And I, I'd like to start with, uh, with Jonas as uh, the kind of part of the R&D division at Boliden. I'd like to hear your thoughts on which, which technology are available today for electrifying. I mean, we talk about trolling so much because that's what's available today and are somewhat proven. Um, looking at the longer term, I. I am a part of Team Battery Power, um, where, I mean, first I can address hydrogen, that, how should I put it, I mean, it is, it feels like a consensus in the industry is that battery power always trump, triumphs hydrogen and fuel cells, unless you have a very unreliable power grid. I mean, that's where hydrogen might come in and have, have a role. And the reason I'm saying this is that is because um, you, you have so much waste of energy due to the low efficiency in, in the fuel cells, as many of you know. It's also rather complex and, uh, and expensive, and you still need a pretty big battery pack. As you can see, for example, in Anglo-Americans, uh, hydrogen truck, they still have like one megawatt hour of battery pack on the truck. And we feel that if you have the power grid for it, it's better to just charge it with much higher efficiency from the power grid. But if you are located in a, in a, in a country with very uh, poor reliability, or perhaps you're, you're relying on 100% solar, I'm not an expert on that because we don't have mines in those kind of areas, it might, it might be a good solution. But if you have if you have strong grids that we do have in in Europe and especially in Northern Europe, we see that pure battery electrification is the way forward. Um, where trolley might come in as a dynamic charging solution, um, and that is, I think that will be case specific. If you have AHS, especially. Uh, you, you might just as well park the trucks and charge them. You don't have any cost of any driver sitting in the truck waiting for it to charge. Um, but, but if you have drivers, uh, and especially if you have a battery solution that's, um, that's sensitive to depth of discharge, you really need to make sure that you manage, that you don't overuse the battery pack because Depending on, on a battery solution, you might uh, have quite high OPEX in, in battery wear and tear. So we see, we see a future of uh, battery trucks where, where trolley might be used for. Where we will have a combination of dynamic charging using trolley and stationary charging. Okay, thanks, Jonas. And, and uh, Johannes, from a uh, Sandvik perspective, do you have the same consideration as... Um... As Jonas, uh, uh, yeah, what, what technology are being pushed as well within Sandvik currently? Yeah, I guess Jonas put it pretty well well together. Uh, our main focus area is also on the electrification around around the batteries. Um, 
thinking about the discussions what we've had with with our clients that seems to be the tendency and the preferred way way going forward um, and and hence we have been working the solutions for the both loaders and, and drills uh, particularly covering the challenges on these weak electric networks um, for example being able to balance the maximum capacity on the grid and then providing uh, some stability from the batteries which are for example located on board uh, to make sure that we don't uh, consume too much energy what's actually available available on the on the on the grid side so yeah i i guess to to, to put it short yeah battery battery technology around and and, and the questions around those has been our, our main main focus areas as well and, and particularly for the underground minings where uh, I guess same goes for the surface but particularly underground mining operating at deeper levels great depths uh, safety is one of the one of the key adoption drivers um, for the technology and at least from us as an OEM perspective uh, we have been able to work around much more feasible solutions what goes for the oper operational safety uh, when thinking about electrification when comparing, comparing um, batteries for example to the to the hydrogen so so same focus areas on, on our side going forward thanks Johannes. i mean i hear in, in both of your uh, answers there's lots of talk about uh, the grid as well and, and and reliability of the grid uh so i'm I, I, my next question will be for merzad uh, what kind of infrastructure are available today to provide uh, the electricity re required for electrification uh, what, what, yeah, what are different solutions? Yeah, actually, I should say, first of all, market is still is evolving. I mean, market is not shaped yet. Uh, we have a, still uh, some distance to be in that point. Uh, we have some also target, for example, for this kind of infrastructure around solution that we are proposing to the market to have a first target is be interoperable. This interoperability is uh, extremely important for us to create the kind of OEM agnostic system that works with everyone, the kind of a standard. But the solution that right now exists is actually a series of solutions, which is uh, some of them new, some of them old. But based on the new technology and correct technology, we are trying to improve those solutions. Uh, starting from trolley system, a kind of hybrid diesel electric uh, trucks, which is connected by a pantograph to the trolley system, shows that in the, actually in the, during the peak load uh, haulage, uh, reduce massively the fuel consumption, um, in the same time increase the speed of the truck. And also we see that the uh, massively reduced of the maintenance costs, especially operational costs, and also very reasonable return of investment, which is normally between two to five years. Another solution that uh, this stage is our focus, creating a kind of fast charging system, which is including a fast charger plus the connector device and also automation system, uh, is a more or less used for the continuous operation when, uh, uh, when uh, uh, standstill time is less than 15 minutes. We have pushed a, a lot for uh, to create innovative solution there. For example, right now we are creating the fastest uh, made in the world uh, charging system, also which is I think the only one is fully automated, which can power up to 600 kilowatts. One of the interesting solution that recently market is asking for, and we are uh, working and putting a lot of time on that, is uh, mo moving towards truly assist battery for the full battery equipped vehicle. Is a kind of a stationary and in motion charging, which is combination of both, which is uh, needs a kind of onboard uh, charging uh, and also offboard charging, which also uh, create a, a, a kind of a, a solution which is include fully automated system, a stationary charging, also trolley system, which is also at the end. Uh, I should say is a very good adaptation for the biggest size of the truck when we talk about above 120 ton, which based on the, the technology of the battery is nearly is not easy to think about it. And also creating the long-term good flexibility uh, for operation of these big trucks because uh, it's uh, actually reduced uh, in considerably the timing of the charging system. For completeness, uh, still I should address to the, the digital platform, which is make this solution complete because by the digital platform, we are trying to monitor, control, and optimize uh, the operation and also energy usage in the real time. That is more or less a list of the solution that we are working these days on that in the EMAN portfolio. I see. And, and so now from a, a minor perspective, so when, Mark, when, when you're exposed to all these solutions which are available to you, how do you make a decision on, on, on which solution you, you go for? Is it based on, on environment uh, impact? Is it based on cost? Is it a combination of different aspects? 
Yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. Thanks. Oh, sorry, it was a question from me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um, it, it really depends on the geography. Um, as Jonas said, you know, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere versus the Southern Hemisphere, your energy provision might be different as well as, as um, your needs around storage and the like. So one of the things that, um, you know, to reinforce that, that point that was made earlier is uh, that um, for, for best energy efficiency in the world, you know, the consensus tends to be that if a renewable energy electron is generated, it should be consumed <laughs> Um, as quick as possible at source without you know too much degradation in the in the energy um, generated and uh, if you can do that through direct electrification power of electricity to to um, vehicles um, through charging or, or through trolley assist that's a that's a very good mechanism from from a technology perspective um, you know it's not just about mobile equipment as well um, when you look at you know the minds of the future when you design from the start looking at at, uh, at the footprint of the mine. A lot of consideration in the mine design comes into play, particularly around open pits, around systems like in-pit crushing and conveying um, out, of the, out of the pit rather than trucking out of the pit. Um, and, and that can be a great way to drive significant energy reduction in the, in the operation as well. So, you know, choosing the technology um, and the approach we're using in, in Glencore is very much fit for purpose. Um, you know, we have some very large scale open cut mining operations in our um, copper business in South America and Africa. Um, we have some very deep underground mines in North America. So, you know, it really comes down to the situation. And, uh, you know, we look across all of the options, as I say, from, you know, removing the truck and using crushing and conveying in the pit through, if you have to have a truck, um, what what type of way of powering that is going to be best. And certainly our view as it unfolds um, is that, you know, battery electric trucks are, are charging ahead in terms of the production and the availability of those. And we would expect them to be, you know, fully available for underground mines in the next three years and, and available for open pit mining on a large commercial scale before the end of the decade. And uh, hydrogen powered trucks, particularly the big um, vehicles are, are likely to lag behind and um, potentially you know, into the, the 2030s, the next decade before we start to see real commercial options in, in that regard. Um, just the last thing on technology as well and, and fit for purpose. I think uh, even in the same mine, in the future, it's likely in our view that you will have some vehicles that will be fully electric and you'll have some vehicles that may require to remain hybrid for some period of time with, with batteries and even small ICEs. And then uh, some vehicles which are more um, difficult to, to connect to catenary cables or, or pentagraphs and the like, and you might need to have those vehicles like dozers and the like that are, that are actually hydrogen driven. So, so it won't be a, a single solution, but the good um, aspect that we're seeing in the industry certainly is that all of those um, solutions are being developed. Mm. I see. And, and um, going, going back to the OEM now, uh, and, and Joannes, uh, I'm curious to know whether actually you see an, an actual uptick in, in mining, mining uh, electrified mining equipment uh going forward like what's uh what's how does it look like uh at sandy yeah like like we i guess spoke about earlier we introduced our first battery operated drill um already in 2016 um since then there's been a lot of discussions around the technology and our customers have been working around the feasibility of it where we are, whether we are talking about the capital expenditure in required to be invested on front versus then the operational cost benefits, what it, it could bring along. And it seems uh, now we are seeing more and more uh, different sort of projects coming to the to the pipeline where our customers are actually looking to renew, renew their complete fleet, whether we are talking about simply an opening a new area for an existing mine or actually a greenfield project to start a mine from the scratch having certain preconditions, for example, from the local, local uh, legislators to have all, all but diesel, diesel underground. So I think um, we are in a trans, 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 transition, like uh, Mark said earlier, 
the, the change is happening as, as we speak. And uh, within our um, upcoming year's forecasts, I believe by the end of the decade, we are seeing by far the maturity of our, for example, underground drill deliveries are being equipped with uh, different sort of battery technologies uh, being fitted in instead of a traditional, traditional diesel. Interesting. And, and I, I'd like now to think a little bit about the, the outlook to elect electrification. Uh, and so I think um, uh, Merzad mentioned it uh, as well is regarding digitalization. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, what is according to you the roadmap to full electrification and digital system? What are the different steps that need to be implemented to, to reach full electrification? Uh, and Merzad, maybe you can comment on this. Yeah, actually, the, it's, it's really difficult to talk about the roadmap of electrification. Digital is, uh, as I said, it's really early to, to really have a good view of how it's going on. But we believe uh, customer minus as a target of zero emission and also reduction of the uh, of the of the cost. Now we need to actually to have a good view on this roadmap. We need to require to do the re-skilling. We need to actually to create a kind of a strategic partnership between technology suppliers. And also we need to understand that we need a kind of fundamental uh, uh, rethink, rethinking about the mine design. These uh, three points I would like to mention as the main three uh, elements in the, in the roadmap of uh, electrification and, uh, and also the, the, the digital platform. Uh, when I say re-skilling, because the customer is telling us that uh, they, they have already understood they are moving towards a new new technology, they need to to consider a kind of uh, new um, uh, a skill profile for the people that they are working in that area. And uh, just very simple example is the driverless truck, uh, which is needs these days for a normal truck, a, a person with a heavy heavy truck license, in the future, uh, that person needs to have a kind of a digital literacy and needs to have, to have a kind of technical planning skill. Therefore, this shift of the uh, skill profile is one of the things that in this roadmap is, uh, is uh, seriously considered by our customer. That's why also in ABB, we are uh, seriously working on the training and also transferring know-how and education to, towards our customer uh, because the electrical system and technology which is coming is completely new. Uh, the second element, as I mentioned, is a partnership and a strategic partnership between the OEMs and technology providers. This is also very important in the roadmap of uh, digital and also electrification because uh, there is a vacuum in the market. You do not see any EPC, EPCM anymore, which is uh, traditionally helping our end user to, to build up the system. Uh, the uh, customer is telling us very clearly from first day that they cannot do it alone. Uh, in this roadmap, they need to kind of create a kind of a strategic work, uh, 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 platform that the OEM or technology provider like us, like other machine manufacturers, work closely together and providing the entire solution, A to Z, what we call it these days, grid to wheel, without any interface uh, uh, forgotten or without any gap, uh, which actually make this uh, roadmap continue. And finally, as a last point is that the miners are gradually coming to the point that uh, uh, is uh, getting rid of uh, uh, actually a diesel system is not so easy. Uh, mine needs to be completely redesigned. That is actually, I, I should say, the most important element in the, in the entire roadmap when electrification and digital needs to be uh, incorporated to the total solution. And this redesign of the mine is, uh, is a bit scary because everything looks different. Uh, who should be in position to do that? And uh, that's why also one of our uh, uh, strategic action in the market is that we want to go uh, beyond that electrification design, going to the position of redesign the mine completely with also collaboration with our partners. Therefore, uh, for that uh, roadmap towards electrification, we consider these three elements. Thank you, Merzad. I think you mentioned collaboration uh, from my little uh, knowledge as a young mining professional uh, on mining. M mining company used to work a little bit in silo and not, not trying, not, not sharing a lot of information between each other. I'm, I'm curious is if 
uh, on, on this journey to, to electrification as this is this changing and, and Jonas maybe I think you mentioned one one collaboration between Boliden, IBB and, and Epiroc how, how do you set up this, uh, this this collaboration and what are maybe some in some instance the challenges of, uh, of such collaboration um, yeah I mean those kind of cl collaborations are, are uh, almost uh, Every one of them are, are case specific, where we simply look at the problem, see how how can we address this, what kind of solutions can we bring, uh, look at what suppliers do we have good uh, collaboration history with um, that can provide good feedback into this, um, and and uh, kind of go for go forward from from there. Um, and I mean, for we have this ABB and Epiroc collaboration in uh, in uh, Ravliden regarding underground trawler, but then we have Sandvik collaboration regarding the upcoming trial of uh, uh, battery loader and uh, etc. So, yeah, we, we do believe that it's that it's crucial to have this kind of collaborations. Um, also, being very open-minded regarding what we learn, because we are relatively small mining company i mean we are far far smaller than glencore for example so we don't have have the muscles to do do uh, that much work in-house so we really are dependent on having pretty much providing a good test or proving ground for our suppliers and being a good uh, uh, partner in developing new technology and and also therefore committing to spreading knowledge and helping suppliers uh, with uh, spreading uh, knowledge about their, their new solutions. So for example, we've been uh, I'm managing a huge number of uh, mine visits uh, to spread knowledge about trolley and ITIC and we will do so for the underground trolley, I'm sure, and we will have done so for many other important projects. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jonas. And, and, and Mark, I'm curious, do you ever saw any uh, example of collaboration at, at Glencore level? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll make a general comment because I've, I've, I've been in the industry almost 30 years now, I guess. So, so for the young mining professionals, they might not have seen what I've seen. But, you know, there was, there was a period of time where the big mining houses back in the 90s had large research and development organizations built in and they did a lot of development in-house um, then the majors really dropped that and became very focused on production um, and were reliant almost solely on dealing with oems or epcms like was discussed to provide solutions for them i think the change in the last you know short period i'd, I'd even say three years maybe two is a significant amount of collaboration again across the um, across the majors. Uh, one of the key platforms that that most of us um, on the call are, are part of is the International uh, Council of uh, Mining and Metallurgy's initiative for cleaner, safer vehicles. Um, and that ICSV program is is a collaborative program that brings together you know twenty seven of the major mining companies in the world together with key OEMs to really workshop and develop. Uh, and an alignment about how is the, the transition roadmap likely to proceed and what are the things we can be doing in a more collaborative sense to fast track um, the development of technology and to make the adoption of technology easier. So, you know, that kind of activity, um, you know, didn't happen five years ago or 10 years ago. So I see a real, you know, upswing in that regard. And, and certainly, um, you know, it's not a case of, of being able to um, put a tender out or, or uh, you know, go and contract a single provider to give you a solution in this regard. There's a significant amount of work to electrify a mine in, on the infrastructure side of things um, because previously all of that energy was trucked in or, or as diesel. Now it has to be fed around the site um, through electrical infrastructure. Um, so you need to have partnerships with infrastructure companies you need to have partnerships with OEMs as uh, Jonas said you know one of the key things to drive fast transformation is the OEMs just can't do all of the testing and development in the background and wait till they've got something right before they release it to the market 
for this to happen quick. They need companies to provide their, their mines and their facilities as testing grounds in the early stage um, to really drive that, um, that quick development and adoption of the technology. And those are the type of activities that are being planned and you know, coordinated through that uh, Cleaner Safer Vehicles program with the ICMM. I see, all right. And, um, and, and, and again, on this collaboration aspect, uh, uh, Joannes, I'm curious to, to hear your, your, your thoughts on what kind of concern uh, in electrification, uh, what are the concerns that uh, you, your customer raise when, when you collaborate on electrification project? Yeah, I guess there are a couple of points maybe highlighting. One, one was briefly, as we dis discussed already, about uh, how how do how do our customers would justify the investment? Of course, they are bigger picture in the game to to go for more green operations and reduce the carbon footprint, etc. But how to do that in an economical way that is this also attractive enough? So uh, that's definitely one of the challenges, and we do recognize that very often when adapt adapting something of a new technology. Uh, there has to be a capital investment to be put up, up front. But of course, the, the, the larger scales benefit is that over a period of a life, for example, when, when talking about a drill, you would replace a diesel engine with a battery pack and electric motor. That's an opportunity to drive down the operational costs. Uh, simply to, a simple example is your fuel costs and also your, your maintenance costs. But of course, the prerequisite of that is that the technology has to be proven. Uh, it has to be robust, designed for um, mining applications. And the best way going forward, like, like Mark pointed out, is that we as an OEM, the only way for us to actually validate the technology is to get engaged more closely with the mining houses, the contractors, um, have the units underground, have the units put underground and run it there, validate what are the actual benefits in, in real operations, not only on, on paper, and also to make sure that the technology, um, what we are bringing to the markets is, is well proven and tested before a larger scale uh, adoption could, could, could take place. So I would say that, that to find a good um, payback time for the investment and also making sure that the technology is, is robust mm -hmm. enough. I guess those are the key questions what we are usually hearing from our customers. Okay, thank you, thank you, Johannes. Um, I think, I mean, thanks for answering this initial question. I, I, we use the next fifteen minutes to open Q and A to question to the to the audience, and I see we already have some uh, some questions in the chat. Uh, so we have one question, which is, how much are operators willing to have some drawback in the utilization of full electric trucks due to charging time versus refuel diesel? Um, and maybe, maybe Johannes you can take this question. Uh, sorry, Jean, can you repeat, repeat the so question? So the question is, uh, how much are operators willing to have some drawback in the utilization of full electric trucks due to charging times versus refuel of, of diesel? Yeah, so I guess this goes a bit of an outside of my area of expertise. I'm, I'm coming from the underground drill, drill side of things. Uh, it, I guess it has to be looked on a case, case specific question. Uh, when, when taking an example from underground drills application, what we have seen is that our customers are pretty often driven by the productivity and certain amount of drill meters achieved. Um, and in that equation, there's very limited amount of room to actually have any separated work phases, like, for example, charge the batteries separately to the normal drilling cycle. Uh, same principle would be uh, applicable for the loaders as well. And hence, there are some solutions available, for example, with the drills uh, to be able to charge the batteries during the normal drilling cycle. For loaders and trucks being able to uh, quickly release the battery off from the equipment and take a new one from the swapping station. Uh, station. We believe that that's the most uh, economical way to drive your uh, loaders and truck operations. And, and hence, we have structurized our offering around that, that sort of a philosophy. Okay, thanks. Uh, and, and maybe, Jonas, you have more experience on, on electric trucks, so maybe do you have any feedback from the operation on, on this question? Uh, well, there's there's uh, two answers here. Uh, first, how much are they willing to have drawback? And that is uh, very low. And how much should they be willing? And that is pretty high. Uh, I mean, we have been around talking quite much at conferences uh, and speaking with, with partners about 
the importance of looking at things from a system perspective. And we, we do see that we in the mining industry has, for obvious reasons, we've been focusing very hard, much on productivity. I mean, getting the maximum ton out of the mine per, per man hour or truck hour or whatever. Um, and that is a pretty good KPI to compare your mining operations as long as you have the same uh, diesel trucks. But when you have battery trucks, the business case will be completely different. I mean, just in, in Sweden with our Swedish diesel prices, diesel, the, the diesel, diesel cost is like more than 50% of the overall costs of transporting ore. And uh, while the, the, the cost of the operator is like one eighth. So you could afford to, to pay the trucks, both pay for more trucks, you could afford to pay um, for the operators, operators sitting within the trucks waiting for them to charge and still have lower to total cost of ownership or lower cost per ton. Uh, but I mean, that is just a, a, a problem right now. But of course, in parallel with this electrification journey, we're also looking at automation. And that also adds I mean, completely, completely changes the business case. So, so I, I see a future where you will definitely need more trucks. Uh, you will have an excessive trucks compared to what, what you have today. You won't have driver shipment. You will have a machine fleet that is stopping in order to charge or using dynamic charging, whatever, what's better from your, your uh, batteries uh, perspective. And you will still get reduced uh, cost per ton. Hmm. Thank you, Jonas. Um, I see there's another question in the chat. Uh, so considering the complexity of the challenge, the roadmap, and how new these issues are, does the panel have any views on the talent and skill requirements to address this? And maybe, Mark, you can take this question. Yeah, thanks. Um, I know um, Mirza sort of mentioned it as a key part of their a part of their um, roadmap that they're looking at around the skills required to support new technologies. Um, you know, the example I would give is uh, we're building a new deep underground nickel mine in Canada, um, Onaping Depth, and this mine effectively starts mining the ore body at, at two kilometres underground and goes to two and a half kilometres underground and. Uh, to support the business case and actually get the mine going, it's going to be a fully electric fleet, um, which we're in the process of, of, of developing right now. Um, so, you know, sort of linking to the last question, on the one hand, um, fully electric, uh, using items like battery swap um, provides the same, if not equal or better um, productivity of equipment. Um, in an underground mining situation like that, but it also enables significant advantages by not having diesel equipment underground, so you don't need large ventilation systems and the like. So it actually helps the over overall economics of, of a mine in that scenario. Um, but what it means is is, is a whole new um, range of um, capabilities, you know, batteries. Um, we're doing a lot of work with our OEMs and, and others around and risks around having batteries on, on mobile equipment in terms of battery fires and the like. And it's so sharing information, learning, developing um, those skills, you know, with their OEMs, particularly supplying like a whole new battery fleet, like for that, um, the Mining Canada, it's about establishing training and, and upskilling of, of tradespeople in the local area, as well as understanding the um, different, you know, automation and, uh, and and technology requirements in terms of digital control and the like that will be required for the fleet. So um, largely it's, you know, essential as part of the planning process to be thinking about, um, about how to um, develop that talent. And I think most of the, the mining companies see this as, as part of the transition as, as has been mentioned around autonomous as well, because on the one hand, autonomous can mean 
um, less people required operating equipment. But on the other hand, it actually means new skills required and retraining of people to be able to maintain different types of equipment than, than what were being maintained in the past. So part of the transition will be to, to balance the, the changing um, demographic of the workforce at, at the different mine sites. Thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, and Merzad, maybe you have a, a different perspective on ABB being a, a diversified um, uh, company. So, uh, uh, is that your mute? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, no, uh, I, I fully agree with Mark. I mean, we, we have seen that there have been this coming from the market side. Is, uh, in this new uh, digitally powered workplaces, uh, employees definitely will move from a routine task to uh, a kind of roles which is require a higher level of thinking, uh, uh, plan activity, and also manage a kind of HMI interfaces. I mean, we need more and more moving in that direction. And I think I heard also that uh, in next three to five years, a uh, mining uh, market is saying that they want to review almost 80% of occupations to somehow be re-evaluated, re redesigned uh, based on this technology change. Therefore, it's uh, quite a serious topic and uh, uh, actually miners need to really seriously think about how this shift of the uh, uh, skill profile is happening. Thank you, Merzad. Uh, I will... Let the audience if there is any additional question from the audience before we conclude this meeting. We'll give a few minutes, one or two minutes for people to put any questions they may have. Yeah, I don't see any new questions from the audience. So I think uh, that now ends our event. Thanks a lot, gentlemen, for interesting discussion and providing answers to, to the, our members' questions. Um, it was really great to have you and we would like uh, on behalf of uh, YMP Switzerland to, to thank you uh, for, for your participation today. That's really appreciated. Uh, thanks also to uh, everyone who joined the event today. Uh, we are looking forward to obviously organizing similar events in the future. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, everyone, and we wish uh, you all a good continuation of your day, and uh, hope to see you again at a uh, future event. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, guys. Yeah.